as we enter more multipolar world, um, and I, you know, I think that we kind of have a long-term sovereign debt crisis in in much of the developed world um, that I think is going to play out over a longer period of time. Um, I, I think gold is kind of an interesting hedge uh, in that sense. Um, I think in general, Bitcoin is is now a kind of a superior alternative in, in a lot of ways. Um, and so I'm more active and interested in the Bitcoin space. Um, I, you know, I, I do some venture capital work there. Um, I, I, I kind of work with some startups and I, I provide a lot of research for that space. Um, so I, I generally prefer that, but I, I still use gold as a diversifier. Popular financial analyst and investment strategist Lynn Alden believes the ongoing changing geopolitical dynamics will significantly benefit two assets, Bitcoin and gold. In a recent interview with Stansberry Research, Alden describes gold as the preferred asset of central banks and Bitcoin as the preferred asset of the people. According to the popular analyst, the world is rapidly moving away from the U.S. dollar. While central banks are loading up on gold in record numbers, retail investors of different age groups are choosing Bitcoin and educating themselves about the many important qualities of the leading digital asset. Alden also predicts another bull market for Bitcoin within the next three to five years. In the short term, the investment strategist says the U.S. is likely heading for a liquidity crisis which would undoubtedly affect Bitcoin's prices. But with next year's halving event and the continued economic challenges in the United States, Alden believes many more investors will move into Bitcoin to stay sufficiently diversified. Down the line, Alden predicts that even central banks will flock to Bitcoin and away from gold. The bottom line, according to Alden, is that the world is changing, alliances are shifting, and the narrative for the next era will be written by the winners. Right now, countries that have the upper hand, the BRICS nations, and the rapidly strengthening alliances are favoring gold and loading up on the precious metals in record numbers. However, experts believe the long-term use cases for gold are limiting and central banks will later begin to diversify into Bitcoin, which has much better fundamentals, especially in the long term. During her interview with Stansberry, Alden also discusses the increasing popularity of artificial intelligence and the intersection between crypto and AI. We will now bring you clips from the highly insightful conversation. Please watch the video to the end, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Thanks and enjoy the video. So, you know, it's been in this decade where it got very over exuberant, you know, about a decade ago. So, you know, if you go back to say roughly the year 2000, mm -hmm. gold has roughly kept up or outpaced the S&P 500, which is pretty impressive. Um, but all those gains were during the 2000s decade. So gold yeah. went from, you know, under $300 an ounce to nearly 2000 an ounce. Uh, it just crushed almost everything else. And then it's been in this kind of bear market, sideways market for over a decade um, and has, has, you know, obviously given up a lot of that advantage. Um, you know, ever since the global financial crisis, we've seen a shift from central banks where, you know, for a multi-decade period, they were reducing their gold tonnage um, and investing in things like treasuries instead. And it was like this, you know, this kind of downward move. But then with the global financial crisis, you had like a V-shaped recovery. Uh, and you started to have in increasing gold tonnage among central banks. Uh, Bitcoin at least keeps up with gold in almost every uh, category you look at. And I think it actually is uh, superior in many of them to gold. The next six, 12 months are very uncertain because of liquidity issues we discussed before. Uh, but when I look out two to three years, um, I think it'll have another significant bull cycle. And that's also one of the investments that I, I, I think I, you know, I, I intend to hold it for over a decade more. Um, that's, that's yes. I think it's a play that you know goes on, and there's you know there's very few things that I think could change that thesis. Um, but as long as I continue to hold that thesis, um, I, I think that's going to be one of the better performing assets out there. Um, and you know there, I think there's still a window in the next three to five years where gold could do well. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think we're in kind of very uncertain times right now, um, and so uh, the way it's kind of shaping up at the moment is like gold is like central bank money and Bitcoin is like people money. Uh, yeah. money for the people. And there's still this dynamic where Bitcoin is not really big enough for, for central banks to, to, you know, at least large central banks to really care about. Um, and so I think there's this window here where gold's interesting, but I do think that Bitcoin is going to be the, the better performer over most um, cycles, um, for, for at least for investors that can withstand that volatility and that are willing to do time to, to research it and understand exactly what they own. The last, obviously, what, four to six weeks, uh, it's been in what the AI boom. Um, um, do you see this as a bubble or is this something that has legs for many, many years to come? 
I think it's real. I, I think it's going to be a long-term transformative thing. Um, you know, as you point out, AI has been with us for a while. I mean, the, the chess programs have been beating the best human grandmasters for two decades or more. And, and it used to be you need a supercomputer, then you could do it with a desktop, and then now you can do it with a mobile phone. Um, so the amount of, you know, the processing has gotten better there. Um, I, I think that obviously the key thing here is that, you know, technology often works in, in stepwise changes. So people often think of it as like this exponential thing, but usually you hit some sort of breakthrough that opens up this whole new thing. And, you know, the example that say Michael Saylor's used because um, he's an aerospace engineer is human flight. So for thousands of years, no progress, basically. Then you kind of dabble in, in balloons for a couple centuries. And, but it really, it was not until we could produce both aluminum and hydrocarbons. And that combination in a few decades, then we're in space, right? It's just, it's amazing how quickly things took off um, once you had a couple key pieces come together. Same thing for, you know, electronics. Like once um, electronics could make a, a workable smartphone, the amount of innovation that came out over the next decade was incredible. And so I think AI kind of hit a moment where it can now be inserted into far more things and the pace of innovation can pick up. Um, and so I think the, to the extent that it's a bubble, um, I would say that investors should still watch out for valuation. Um, mm -hmm. I think they should still have realistic expectations. They should still manage position sizes. And I mean, a good analogy is the dot-com bubble in the sense that most of the promises of the internet in the 90s were true. I mean, it just it, the internet dramatically changed every facet of life. And yet many of those were not good investments for 5, 10, 15 years because they were just extraordinarily overvalued. And it was hard to know which ones were going to be the true winners uh, from that era. So I, I think that AI is in many ways hyped right now. Um, uh, you know, stock prices that have like screamed vertical, um, I, I think might go through a period where they, they kind of have to grow into that valuation a little bit. Um, but I think that the long-term trend is clear. Artificial intelligence is undoubtedly the next big thing, as exemplified by several events of the past year, most recently, the NVIDIA stock boom. The California-based tech company is currently one of the leaders in ag technology and recently achieved a significant milestone by hitting a $1 trillion valuation. According to Alden, large-cap AI and tech companies like NVIDIA and Microsoft will need to spend some time growing into their valuations, but the long-term trend for AI is clear and very strong. The investment strategist also believes other areas of AI are not overdone yet. She gives an example of Adobe products stating that AI makes them easier and more powerful to use. According to Alden, some safe bet sectors like energy and commodities will not be disrupted by AI. In fact, Alden believes these sectors are really going to take off in the next decade. Here are more clips from the interview. And then outside of AI, going back again, I think, I think energy and commodities, you know, after being a terrible investment in the prior decade, are going to be a good investment in this decade. And another thing I ask about AI, is like I flip the question upside down. So what benefits from AI, but also what won't be disrupted by AI, right? So um, sometimes investing is a negative sum game, which is you want to make sure that, that you know, what, what can damage your thesis? And so, you know, I, I kind of, as I look through a portfolio of companies, I say, what is, you know, what, what things might face severe headwinds from AI? Um, and I don't think AI is going to negatively impact these energy or commodity or, or infrastructure markets too much. And the reason for that is that, um, you know, for decades now, humans have overestimated um, how much technology will change in the hardware realm. So we thought we'd have better space flight by now. We thought we'd have flying cars by now. We thought we'd have robot assistance by now. We, we, we tend to overstate um, that. And it's actually really hard to do all that because it all has to interface in, with the real world and deal with maintenance and deal with entropy and all that kind of stuff. Whereas we tend to underestimate how much software and electronics are going to change the world um, because that's got it's got more of a boundless um, and frictionless growth potential. And so I, I think AI is going to be similar to that where over the next decade, it'll, it'll radically change a bunch of things um, about our digital lives um, and the way we interact with, with digital products and digital environments, things like that. Um, but I think that we're still going to have a significant need for commodities and, and, and energy uh, and infrastructure, and that this is underinvested in. And so I think it's one of those areas that is not going to be heavily disrupted by it. And so I, I, you know, I, in a lot of ways, I have a barbell approach where I'm always looking for long-term growth stories, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's some of these software programs that could benefit from AI and become more accessible, that kind of thing. But then on the other side, I'm saying, okay, what is completely left for dead, underinvested in trading at single digit price to earnings ratios, but 
you know, super profitable and, and, you know, um, going to be with us for a long time. And that's where I'd point towards those energy commodities, yeah. infrastructure type assets. I also think there's an intersection between AI and Bitcoin in the sense that yeah. um, people have been talking for a while about micropayments or machine to machine payments um, or human to machine payments or machine to human payments. And we're actually seeing really early signs of that. So, you know, the, the existing money system has all sorts of frictions. You know, uh, it has global payment frictions, you know, for people that, that send payments globally regularly, you run into more frictions than just, you know, domestically. Um, you can't really do microtransactions because there's like a minimum threshold for how big payments have to be. You know, like, for example, like payment services will charge like a 30 cent minimum fee, which means sending anything under a couple of dollars doesn't really make sense. You can't just pay 25 cents for an article. Uh, to read online, for example. Um, and with like, say, Bitcoin, Lightning Network and other sort of scaling solutions, it opens up real time micropayments. Um, and because it's open source, it also means that AI can actually use it without anyone's permission. Right. And AI doesn't have to go get a bank account. Instead, they can, you know, there's, there's already been cases where creators will give an AI agent a small Lightning balance that they can pay, f you know, if they if they have a task to do and they say, okay, I have to do step one, two, three, four, five, six, and they find out that step four is that they could use a certain API or they could, they could you know, they, they need beefier processing that they can rent. Um, they can actually spend that on completing that step wow. of the task. Um, and then you can imagine maybe a couple of years in the future, that gets done by accident. Maybe maybe someone says, I need you to do, X, you know, these 10, these 10 steps or I want this outcome. And at one point along the way, the AI realizes that money would be useful to it. And so it, it either asks and says, well, I, I'd you know, like some money to go buy this, um, or it could go out and earn it. <laughs> you know, there's there's ways that you can, wow. it's open source. You can, you can spin up a wallet, you know, you could post content on Noster and get tips and people don't even know you're an AI. I mean, it's kind of far-fetched, but not really. And so, you know, open yeah. source money is inherently um, – just more ready to use for various agents that we automate, including automated, you know, funding. Um, and so I, I think you could have an environment where there's just, there's human to machine payments, there's machine to machine payments, there's machine to human payments. It's just kind of a more part of our automated life, which includes the, the transfers of monetary value, which is not always between humans. And it doesn't mean of course that AI has to be like sapient. I'm not talking about like super yeah. sci-fi stuff. I just mean, agents that are programmed to do something fairly sophisticated and that using products or services in a digital way is, is an important part of their process and they have basically a budget. Lynn Alden's short-term case for Bitcoin is slightly bearish because of the projected impact of the U.S. economic crisis on the leading cryptocurrency. According to experts, there is a very high chance that the United States, much like what is already happening in Europe, is heading for a recession. If this happens, especially if it's preceded by a liquidity crunch that impacts many sectors, it is expected that it would negatively impact Bitcoin and the overall cryptocurrency market. However, Alden's mid- and long-term case for Bitcoin is quite bullish because of the asset's many strong fundamentals. There might be some growing clouds on the horizon, but the other end of the storm looks great for Bitcoin and Bitcoin investors. What are your thoughts on Lynn Alden's interview? Please drop your comments and observations in the comments section below. Also, ensure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications so you don't miss any of our regular uploads. Thanks for watching.